All right, so in memory performance, you will get this, okay? And then hopefully the, the contrast between the text will be okay here, just be without too much problem. So machine learning and deep learning with Apache Ignite, okay? So we'll focus on this uh, today. Now, Ignite, very capable product, does a lot of stuff. Uh, it's been likened to a kind of Swiss Army knife, okay? So it's got a variety of components of which, because of time limitations today, we can only discuss a little bit. So what I'll do then is just give you a very quick overview of Ignite, and then kind of look at this data science toolkit. We'll look at a couple of these things in a little bit of detail. Uh, have some demos to show you as well, very simple, basic stuff, okay? Just to show you where these things go. And for those articles on DZone, there's links to my GitHub repository, so you can download the code, build it, play around with it. Again, very, very simple, just to you know, prove a point, show you some examples that uh, uh, you can get going with really quickly. All right, so you will often see this. Okay, this is the kind of high-level architectural view, what, how you Americans say, you know, 30,000 foot view, 50,000 foot view of uh, what Ignite is. So at its heart is this memory-centric story, okay? So historically, where Ignite has come from and is as an in-memory data grid, right? Designed to solve two problems, scale and performance. Cache, okay? Using the power of the cluster, <laughs> Cache the data and then run queries across that at memory speeds. Okay, no need to persist anything. Again, going on from what uh, um, uh, you know was uh, discussed in the previous presentation. It's all about definitions and terminology. It's okay, but the idea here is that basically you're keeping everything in memory, and therefore there's a whole bunch of things that you don't have to worry about. Okay, so it, that can work really well. Now. Over time, what's happened, particularly since I've been with the company, which is uh, getting on for almost a year and a half now, they've added a whole bunch of other features. So, it's got SQL support, okay? It's always had some level of SQL support, but last year they really went in for SQL 92, all right? So whether you like it or you hate it, you know, SQL support is there. And I think there's a couple of benefits to this. I mean, it's intergalactic data speed. So, lots of BI tools, uh, third party tools use it, you plug in with it, that makes sense. If you need skilled developers, very easy to find SQL developers. Okay? Indeed, advertised, you can find people with these skills. Um, and, you know, the other thing is it's declarative. So essentially, you specify what you want, the system goes away, does all the hard work for you, figures out the best way to retrieve the data for you, and it does that for you. Okay? You as a developer have less to worry about. Okay, it's a key value store. And the value could be anything. So you may be working with other key value stores. Redis, for example, fabulous product, you know? Very fast, caching technology, key value. But the thing is with Ignite, the value can be simple types, integer, character, floating point, date, time, whatever you want. Or it can be complex types, okay? Because it's Java based. So it could be a financial instrument, for example. Or it could be a healthcare record, right? As complex as you want. It does transactions. And it does the two types of transactions. So it does lock-based transactions, okay? We're talking about ACID, you know? And lock-free optimistic transactions. So they're different kind of use cases. And let me give you a kind of practical example of uh, why this is useful. So I'm a great fan of MOOCs. I like these massive open online courses. And, you know, EDX, Coursera, so on. So earlier this year, uh, I was on the website of one of these um, uh, vendors, and I decided there's a particular course I like. I would like to get a certificate. Get my credit card out, put the details in, I hit the pay button, and it comes back and says, there is an error. Okay, I didn't think too much about it, right? <coughs> Sometime later, I look on my credit card statement, and I notice that I've actually been billed. Now, I go to the merchant, they say, we haven't received the money. I went to the bank and they said, you've been billed because you took this particular service. Uh, I'm left picking up the tab, you know, because I still have to pay. You know, the bank is gonna come after me if I don't pay them the money. So where's the money, all right? There is an example of a poorly designed system, all right? So what we want is for the system to move from one consistent state to another consistent state. It's like the uh, banking example. So, you know, transferring, if I want to send you $100, uh, it must leave my account and be credited to your account. Uh, either all of that happens or none of it happens. Okay, we can't have a situation where one happens and the other one doesn't. That's, again, not consistent and not transactional. 
so, lock-based transaction, very, very useful. I think particularly for the financial uh, space where Ignite and its commercial kind of grid gain offering, about 50% of the use cases tend to be in the financial world. Okay, they like that capability. Uh, the other approach, the uh, lock-free optimistic, uh, again, there are examples, for example, say computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, where it isn't necessarily, you know, you don't have the overhead of, uh, of, of locks. You copy a chunk of the design onto your local workstation, you work on that, then you check that back into a central repository. Chances are you're not going to conflict with anyone else, okay? So you don't need that locking overhead. Uh, compute services we won't cover. Streaming. So Ignite can plug in with a streaming technology. Spark Streaming, for example. Flink. Or if you're using Kafka, okay? So it doesn't duplicate, doesn't reinvent the wheel, does not uh, replicate what other technologies do, but happily <coughs> connects with these through adapters and connectors. So that can work really well. And the last thing there is the uh, machine learning, okay, which was in beta last year for quite a while, and it's GA now, and really they are pushing it ahead quite significantly. So even the version that I've got on my machine is way, way out of date already. They've added lots of tutorials to that, and if you're particularly interested in deep learning, then things like TensorFlow, for example, integration with that is coming very soon. Fingers crossed, okay? It just depends. Um, you know that the way that the open source projects tend to work, it's community driven, okay? They vote on what things are important, what the community wants to uh, do, because again, resources are finite. You know, there's only a certain number of people available to, uh, to do the development work. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, two other things then. Um, Ignite will happily work with third-party storage. And if it works, if you're using, say, a transactional system, typically that's relational, uh, say Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, or any of these uh, relational database systems, then Ignite can act as a cache for that. Okay? And that cache that it has, plus the, the backend system, are kept in sync. So if there are changes in the cache, they are propagated to the backend. Now, you might think, well, okay, what, about, what happens if there are changes in the database? You need help there. Oracle Golden Gate, probably, uh, or something of that sort to, uh, to help you. But in the case that Ignite is being used to cache data and you're processing that data in memory, then that cache and the backend are kept in sync, okay? If you're using something else, like a NoSQL, HDFS, or some other storage mechanism, um, it's going to be some work for you, okay? Because Again, Ignite can't help you. It can't guarantee the consistency, and therefore you will need to uh, do development on that yourself. All right, one other thing. Native persistence was added last year. So now what you can do is you can treat Ignite as a distributed SQL database. Um, Google and Spanner, CockroachDB, these kind of products you may have heard of, then Ignite gives you that capability. So again, it's, it's the issue that unless you are Twitter, Facebook, or Google, who tend to have lots of money and huge amounts of uh, resources, and they can cache enormous amounts of data, uh, the rest of us, we don't have those capabilities or maybe those requirements. So we might store quite a lot of data, but not need all of it in memory. So you know, we could have like 10 terabytes, uh, 10 petabytes, or whatever you, you know, uh, bytes of uh, data you have stored here, and then uh, periodically we may be using Ignite's capabilities, for example, to speed up certain queries, it can page in the data, it can run things at memory speeds, and it has recovery mechanisms as well. So it behaves like a database system. In that, uh, um, and there are other kind of in-between type of scenarios that uh, we, we've got a special slide on that, which I haven't got today, but if you're interested, just drop me a message and uh, we can uh, send that. Okay, so that's in, in uh, a reasonable kind of nutshell of what it is that it does. Uh, let's quickly drill down into machine learning then. So really the, the rationale why they added this kind of machine learning library to Ignite is that typically if people are working with this type of technology, chances are you might want to do some analytics. You might want to get some business insights into that data. Or, for example, you could be streaming data in. Um, the, the example, one of the uh, articles that I just did uh, recently for DZone was looking at credit card fraud detection in real time. So, in that scenario, for example, you could have data arriving, okay, transactions, and then perhaps you want to 
have a law can do some fast analysis of that, uh, be able to differentiate between what are fraudulent transactions and okay transactions. And you know, machine learning, you may have a classifier that you've built and trained, and it can help you do that analysis and be able to identify those different types of uh, uh, classes of uh, uh, you know, whether it's fraud or not fraud. Um, previously, to do something like that, you had to copy everything out, ETL everything out of Ignite into some third party system to do that. That's expensive and it's time consuming. Okay? <coughs> You can do things in place now. So running these machine out and learning algorithms directly on the data in place in Ignite. The other thing is that you get scale. Because, okay, you know, as data scientists, typically you'll just use a laptop. You know, that's what you do to build your models, and then you try and scale those up to a larger, larger level. But there you're working with a single server. Now, what happens if you need more complex solutions? And what happens <coughs> if uh, it, it, you know, you're trying to remove the burden from the developer's perspective as much as possible. Let the system do the hard work for you. Let it run the algorithms for you. Let it figure out uh, and detect these kind of anomalous uh, events that you're looking for. Okay, so use the power of the cluster to do the hard work for you. Okay. Um, Memory-centric storage, okay, I kind of covered that, so I will move on to the next one. Uh, this is useful. This is the kind of compute grid. So if you're familiar with how MapReduce works or fork join in Java, you guys who are kind of uh, skilled Java developers, it's something you probably use in your production environment. So this is essentially how Ignite deals with things. You've got work that comes in, jobs that come in. These are broken down into tasks. So Ignite looks at the available resources on the cluster, divide and conquer, okay, utilization, uh, where certain servers are being underutilized, it will know and be aware of that. It will be able to target those and send work there. Um, the results are sent back, it combines them, and then sends them back to the client. Okay, so again, you're using the power of the cluster to do the work for you. And then all the standard things like load balancing, automatic failover, these are supported as well. Okay, it is a peer to peer system. There is no master slave, it is every node is identical. Okay, and you can just scale out and add more nodes as you need them. Uh, and if you, you know, that, that whole kind of elasticity, if you don't need those resources, take those resources out. It is fine. Okay. Very useful. Now, I, there's a reason why I showed you this, because in a moment I'm going to show you something on genetic algorithms which looks kind of awfully similar to this. Okay, that's how it works. And one of the things that comes with Ignite. Right, so the machine learning grid. So, large scale parallelization, which I've talked about, great advantage. Zero ETL, again, fabulous, because now you can use algorithms in place, very, very useful. You can do stuff on that data that you've already got in your system. These algorithms are designed to work in a distributed environment. They have been written from the ground up to take advantage of cluster computing, okay? So they aren't confined to a single server. Now you can span the entire cluster and be able to run your k-mean clustering, um, you know, all of these other types of uh, machine algorithms that are supported. Uh, there's multi-language support, okay, so REST, Java, obviously. Okay, so the three languages that are it's kind of the tier one languages that Ignite support is Java, product is written in Java, .NET, and C++. Anything else at the moment, you have to use JVC and ODBC, but other languages are coming along, particularly the support for Python, I think, very useful for data scientists. That's what you're looking for. But this kind of gives you the big picture, if you like, of where the vision is going certainly as far as this particular component of Ignite is concerned. Okay. All right, now, I'll skip these, okay, because I think in my presentation, those might get me, but given the difficulty we have with the uh, projector, we'll uh, skip those. All right, so, a very useful feature that Ignite provides is this thing called partition-based data sets, okay? So, the idea here is that when you're working with things like machine learning algorithms, typically they are iterative, okay? There is context, and that context changes as you're running the algorithm. Now, in a cluster environment, if bits of your cluster go down, you lose some nodes, it can be disastrous, okay? You may have to restart a job. Now, if you've been running something for 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, or something like that, now time is money. You've got to restart and get things running again. So, Ignite provides this capability uh, to essentially help alleviate this type of 
scenario where it keeps replicas of data. And so it looks visually something like this, okay? So you have nodes um, and the kind of the low level storage, if you like, or the mechanism that the client uses is this notion of partition, okay? Partitions contain context and they contain data, okay? And if you lose one of these, because we can create replicas of these, okay, you can, typically in a distributed environment, probably you want to have at least one replica of your data. You can have more, okay, but then there are issues in terms of ensuring that that data are consistent across your cluster. Okay, so you do training, you do training, again, it's, it, it's map reduced light. It's not exactly map reduced. Okay, there's an important distinction there. But this is a very useful feature particularly if you're going to work and run these algorithms across large amounts of data. You know, hardware, network, all these things are a little bit unpredictable. You don't know what may happen. And because typically the way that a lot of these algorithms work, you know, it's a kind of an iterative process, you know. Training, solution, maybe you refine the algorithm. And if you think about things like credit card fraud detection, for example, uh, with Ignite, then what you can do is as new data arrive, thank you, Tom, um, then you can refine your classifier, you can improve its quality based upon any new data that arrives. Okay? So you can continuously evolve and, uh, and improve that with new data. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so I, I briefly touched upon this already. All right then, so what algorithms are supported? So we've got classification, regression, okay, this is, I know the font is a bit too small for you, but there's some ideas about where you can apply these. So things like spam detection, for example, stock prices, revenue, all of these types of things. And uh, just the other half of this, clustering, pre-processing, so things like customer segmentation, for example, or just being able to group things and be able to find certain patterns. Okay, so these are all well documented through the uh, website and the documentation. Okay, I'll show you a quick demo in a moment. Let me just uh, get on and quickly just say a couple of words about genetic algorithms. And so this is a, a kind of a subset of the machine learning library that comes with Ignite. So this is kind of interesting. When I looked at this, I'd never heard of it before. So I did a little bit of digging, uh, looked on Wikipedia, did some uh, Google searches to find out a bit more about this. So with this, it tries to simulate biological evolution. So you have this notion of chromosomes and genes and uh, the ability to kind of model complex problems with this type of uh, approach. And it can work for some complex problems, okay? Again, it's a case, it's not a solution for all problems, but it may help you in certain situations. So again, there's a library, uh, some examples that come with Ignite that show you how to do this and be able to apply this to uh, certain types of problems. Okay, crossover, mutation, fitness calculation. Basically, you're figuring out, have I got the, the ideal solution, okay? It's very, very easy. Okay, so this is, uh, recall the earlier slide that I showed you, okay? So the way that this works is very similar to the way that the compute grid works, and it's partly why this is kind of a successful approach, because it, 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 it takes advantage of the uh, capabilities that we have previously in terms of uh, fork join and the ability to uh, um, you know, separate out the load across the uh, different nodes in our cluster. They can work quite effectively, okay? That's why... I wanted to show you that slide earlier. Um, and again, the thing is that with genetic algorithms, as is the case with a lot of machine learning, it's a kind of iterative thing. So you start off with your problem, you start off with a particular sort of value, and then you, you, you have some termination conditions, say, you know, have I got the answer yet? If not, keep going, do some selection, do some crossover, do some mutation, as is the case with, uh, you know, evolution, biological evolution, and then you go back and start again, and then reevaluate it until you get some result, okay? Very, very straightforward, quite easy. Okay, and I think that's the second demo. Uh, uh, I'll quickly show you that in just one moment. So the key thing is, I think, the message that I try to get across is that with this distributed machine learning, deep learning, um, the advantages that the cluster computing gives you is way, way more than just using it on a single server. Zero ETO, very, very useful, okay, because now you save a lot of time and resources copying things from one system to another system because that system can't do everything that you need. So the ability to run these things in place on the data that you have, or even as data is being streamed in, okay? So think of the situation where data are arriving, and then now you could do some analytics on that in real time. You could run some SQL queries on that. 
You can run the machine learning algorithms on that. Okay? So you can make business decisions very, very fast. And this whole kind of fault tolerance, continuous learning based upon this partition based data sets gives you some confidence uh, and provides some redundancy because you know, life is unpredictable, hardware is unpredictable, the network is unpredictable. Okay? These things can cause problems and a lot of um, issues down the road. All right, very quickly then, and I'll just show you a quick demo then after that. So, summary of the uh, Ignite project. So, it's number one. These are numbers from the Apache Software Foundation, just recently published, okay? We are number one in terms of the developer list. Awesome, you know, there's about five or six guys with Grid Game just sit on that list answering all questions. Some people at Grid Game not very happy about that, okay? So, free consulting, free advice, but there you go. I mean, that's the commitment by the company. So. Any issues that you have, anything you want to ask, sign up, ask there, and there are some really, really helpful people. And not just from Grid Game, okay? It's, a, it's much larger than one company. Okay? It's a huge community around the world that can uh, assist you. Uh, we are number two as far as the user list is concerned, and in terms of overall number of commits, it's number four. Okay? So there you can see it's a very, very active project uh, and uh, a lot of communities, community support. All right? Now, I'll try my best see if this display will let me show you anything. Uh, let's have a look. I had it previously loaded. Just uh, momentarily see if I can launch that. Okay, so it does seem to be uh, loading up and then I've already got this uh, couple of examples preloaded. So as I said before, best thing to do, have a look at the uh, D zone space that I have, particularly the articles that I've written, is you know, K means clustering, KNN, um, there is fraud detection, there's a variety of things that I, I've taken the time over the last couple of months to write about just to show you some examples of how we might be able to do this. So, can I zoom in here? Yes, I can. All right, so this is just using the uh, standard Ignite uh, distribution that I just. Uh, and said, there's a pom.xml, just load it in, and all these examples come in as part of that. So machine learning library, clustering, genetic algorithms, you know, hello world, and so on. And so all of these examples are there. And let me just uh, give you a quick flavor of this. So I'll run this uh, hello world genetic algorithm for you. Now, it's uh, going to be slightly underwhelming. You know, it's just a whole bunch of output that's coming out. So essentially what's happening is this algorithm is running. Um, the target result that I'm looking for is the string hello space world. And I've given it uh, a base to start with. So I've told it, you know, the uh, alphabet, capital A to Z, and the space character. And basically I've initiated it and it just goes away and runs and runs and runs and runs. Um, you know, using that iterative sort of uh, flow chart that I showed you, and at some point it, the evaluation proves to be true, it's achieved its result, and it just stops, and then it tells you how many generations it took to actually arrive at that answer. So this will keep going for a moment or two, okay, but uh, um, it's, we're almost there. And it's the same with a lot of these other machine learning examples, okay, they are standalone. You don't need anything special to work with them, they are meant as examples to, to, for you to learn and to teach yourself and to uh, have the ability to run on a small scale, but remember what I said. These algorithms are designed for distributed systems, large scale. They will work uh, across a cluster of machines and be able to utilize the resources and the power of the cluster in order to do so. Okay, so I apologize, Tom. I'm, I think I'm maybe a couple of minutes over, but uh, all right, great. Fabulous, thank you. I think maybe time just for one question or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. So, uh, we're just around the corner. And by the way, it, 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 there's a saying in English, you know, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. I didn't realize how hot it was when I got out of the hotel, so I'm overdressed, and I could barely breathe just walking down the sidewalk, you know, it's terrible. It is really, really hot here. I thought it was hot in London, and this is worse. So, you know, as global warming, maybe, I don't know. So, so. Okay, any issues, any concerns, questions, anything that I can help you with? If you... If there's anything that uh, yeah, comes to mind, by all means, please contact me. Okay? So it's just first name dot last name, akmal.chari at gridgame.com. Be careful how you spell my surname. It's about eight or nine different ways to do it. Typical South Asian name, okay? That's the nature of, uh, uh, of coming from South Asia. But if you, you know, you'll be able to spot it on the meetup page and uh, uh, when I
what I gave you on the uh, LinkedIn page. But happy to answer anything that, you know, is there any, any question? Yeah. Yes, question. Does it make it slow? Sorry? Does it, if you say it's written in Java? Yes. Doesn't that make it slow? Okay, so the question was that because it's written in Java, doesn't that, does that not make it slow? Uh, yes and no. So what they've done with Ignite is that you know that uh, one of the things with using Java, the JVM particularly, does have some garbage collection, the whole range of things, and particularly if you're working with large amounts of memory, it essentially you can just freeze your entire system. With Ignite, what they've done is they've minimized that capability really down to a tiny amount, and it has its own memory management system that does all the other stuff. So yes, it's written in Java, but it really performs well. Um, now, if you're interested in benchmarks, there are some white papers and things that they publish which show that the performance is, is you know, very good. Uh, it depends, again, what your scenario is, what your business use case is. But as I said before, about half the users of this technology come from the financial domain, and they demand performance. Okay? And they are looking for insights and value and immediate results. So it can be very, very fast. Okay? Great question. Um, and the other thing is to remember, uh, I, I mentioned that there are three sort of languages that it supports, so Java is one of them, but .NET and C++. So there is a way that you can store things in a kind of binary neutral format within Ignite, and so it doesn't matter what language you use to access it, whether it be .NET or C++, and of course those languages don't have those kind of issues in terms of, uh, uh, of Java, because the, they will connect them and be able to utilize their, their capabilities. Yes, question? <coughs> Ah, yes, okay, classic uh, example. So the gentleman was pointing out the fact that this looks a lot like Spark. Um, yes, it's a, it's a question we get asked over and over again. Um, the two technologies are complementary, okay? Uh, Spark is a great in-memory compute engine. It's got some machine learning as well, and it has streaming capability. Uh, remember, Ignite doesn't provide streaming per se, but it's happy to work with Spark or Flink or Kafka or some other uh, types of technology ad adapters. Uh, think of Ignite as more of a, a, a distributed database, something that can act as a persistence layer for Spark. So I know that with a lot of Apache projects, sometimes there tends to be a lot of overlap between them. In fact, sometimes there's a lot of overlap between them. And there's a lot of confusion as well, because people say, oh, should I use this or should I use that? Um, what I say to people is that if you're using things like streaming technologies, say you're a, a, a strong Spark streaming user or you're a Flink user, there's no point to, to switch to Ignite just for that. Those things do their job very well. You can use Ignite for additional capabilities. So you can use it for uh, running analytics, for example. It can do OLTP operations. We talked about transactions, for example, to key value store. It's great for just caching. So if you just use it for caching, and don't use it for anything else, which is, I think, still the vast majority of use cases, that's fine. Um, but it integrates with Spark, so there's two uh, blog posts that I just recently wrote on the Grid Game website discussing how you can use it with RDDs and data frames um, and the, the complementary nature of the two technologies. We've actually got some slides that do a kind of side-by-side -side comparison as well. And if it's something you're interested in more, please just drop me an email, we're happy to point you to those resources. But great question again. Yeah, it's it, you know what to do. It's the uh, nature of the Apache Software Foundation. You know, everybody tends to do, want to do everything now. So if you look at things like Kafka, for example, it supports KSQL. You know, there's SQL support there as well. It gets confusing. It gets tough. Great for you guys because lots of choice, but also bad in some ways because then it's confusing. You know, what do you, what to decide which which one of these great products to use? What to do? So, okay, great. Okay, thank you. Guys. I called it the disco 